Yeah, also, uh, yeah, so let me just set up the screen share. Um, yeah, also, I just wanted to encourage everyone again about the, the TA sessions. Um, I, I think even if you haven't uh, done the problem set, so, so one is that you're very welcome to talk about previous, um, well, especially now that the, um, right. Uh, to talk about the the worksheets from previous uh, previous lectures, and also if you even if you haven't actually looked at the worksheet and just want to you know learn stuff or or talk about math in general, you, you should definitely uh, you're very much encouraged to go to these um, to these TI sessions. Um, okay, so I want to yeah. So I'm sorry for a bit of a mess yesterday. Um, I want to try to tie some of these things up today. Um, and um, so, yeah, so let me just recall some of uh, where we were yesterday. Um, so, right, so let E be a local field. Uh, of characteristic not equal to two. Um, so then one of, I guess, one of the basic objects that we're going to be interested in, in this course uh, is, uh, is the Hilbert symbol. So let me, let me define that again. So, uh, the Hilbert symbol uh, is the following function. So it's a function in two variables, which goes from e cross modulo e cross squared times e cross modulo e cross squared to uh, plus or minus one. Uh, so right. So I'll write it as Hilbert symbol sub e, just to emphasize that it's the version for the local field e. Um, Right, so it's going to be defined uh, via the following formula. So the Hilbert symbol of a comma b. Uh, so if I have elements of, of the field E or non-zero elements, it's defined to be one if z squared minus ax squared minus by squared uh, has a non-trivial uh, solution. So in other words, if this quadratic form one comma um, minus a comma minus b is, uh, is isotropic um, and it's minus one otherwise. Okay, so, so it's a function on, right, so, so, okay, so, right, so I guess if you define it this way, it's, 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 it's sort of clear that uh, it, it only depends on a and b modulo modulo squares. Um, so you can think of it as a function on e cross modulo um, modulo squares uh, times itself. Um, and yeah, it's just defined this way so that it takes values in um, in plus or minus one. Okay, so right, so let me write down some properties of the Hilbert symbol. So properties of the Hilbert symbol. Uh, right, so 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 first of all, it's symmetric. So a comma b uh, is equal to b comma a um, so by inspection. Uh, and two is that, uh, well, there are so certain sort of cases in which the Hilbert symbol is automatically plus one. So a comma minus a is equal to plus one. And uh, sorry, a comma one minus a is equal to plus one. So this, this latter example is if a is in E cross and it's also not one, right? So I mean, so this is this is because, uh, um, right? Because you can, if you, if you look at the quadratic form, z squared minus a a x squared plus a y squared, that's going to have a solution given by zero one one, um, and similarly the quadratic form, well, right? So 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 namely we take z comma x comma y to be equal to, um, I think. I think I just want to take it to be one comma one comma one. And so that gives a non-trivial solution. Um, so, so in this case, it's automatically equal to um, equal to one. Um, and then there's one more uh, relation that we get for free. Uh, so which is that a comma b uh, is equal to a comma minus a b. Um, one sort of natural relation we get on the Hilbert symbol, right? So, so, so why is that? If you take the quadratic form z squared minus ax squared minus by squared, well, that has a zero if and only if 
Well, you can multiply it by a, so you get a z squared uh, minus a squared x squared minus a b y squared. And then you can multiply that by minus one again. So, so this has a zero if and only if the second one has a zero. Um, if and only if, um, well, right, so we can rewrite this as a, well, we can multiply by minus one, and then that's ax squared um, minus az squared plus aby squared. And then rescaling x, we get it into the form one comma minus a comma ab. So, so we also have this relation, I mean, I guess just by sort of manipulating, sort of rescaling and manipulating the quadratic form. Okay, so, so far so good. And in fact, what I've said, uh, so the, these, these properties are, um, they haven't used the, the fact that E is a local field. So, so, so right now, I mean, this definition would have made sense if E is any field. Um, and these properties so far would be true if, if E is any field. Um, but uh, in fact, we're only gonna be interested in this when E is a local field. And that's because uh, of the following sort of really fundamental property, uh, which is that the Hilbert symbol is bilinear. Uh, and in fact, right, so it's, it's, it goes from E cross mod E cross squared times E cross mod E cross squared at two plus or minus one, which I could think of as F2. Um, and so it's, it's actually a bilinear, it's a bilinear map of F2 vector spaces. Uh, and it's actually non-degenerate. So it, it, it's a non-degenerate pairing between E cross mod E cross squared and itself, um, which is going to exist for, um, so this property, yeah, so, so for any, any local field of characteristic not two. Um, so this is really the, a key sort of fundamental feature of the Hilbert symbol, uh, which is actually not at all obvious from the definition of the fact that, well, first of all, it's bilinear um, and two, that it's non-degenerate. Um, so in fact, uh, Right, so, so, so why is it in fact bilinear? Um, I think that, so to my knowledge, this is not something that really has a, so for, for any local field of characteristic not two, to my knowledge, this is not something that one has a really direct and elementary proof of. I mean, so, um, so it, it sort of falls out from the general uh, sort of local class field theory, this, this bilinearity and non-degeneracy is contained in there. Um, but let me try to sort of try to explain what's what's going on. Like why why is this this thing bilinear? So so given an element a and e cross, well if a if a is a square, then 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 it's automatic. The Hilbert symbol is automatically one, so we can right, we may as well assume it's not a square. Um, but so then a comma b is equal to one if and only if right. So z squared minus a x squared minus b y squared has a solution, and Right, so if you sort of rewrite this, this is the same thing as saying that B is a norm in the quadratic extension. Uh, so it's a norm from the quadratic extension E square root of A to E. So B is in the image of the norm map, which goes from E adjoin the square root of A or the non-zero elements in there into E cross. So because you have this quadratic extension, um, right, so you have this quadratic extension E at or in the square root of A over E. And so then you get a norm map, um, which goes from the multiplicative group of, of that field extension back to, to E cross. Um, and uh, this, this quadratic form has a solution. Well, if, if it has a solution, uh, because then, well, right. So, so, so then B is equal to the norm of uh, Z minus the square root of A divided by X over, over Y. So, so just sort of writing out explicitly the, you know, the formula for the norm, then, then, then you get this. Um, and in fact, uh, so what local class field theory gives you is that this, this image of the norm is actually an index two. So it's always a subgroup, but it actually has index two. So image of the norm from E square root of A uh, is index two. Um, and that's that's actually what bilinearity is giving you. So it's 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 telling you that if you fix an element a, and then as you let b vary, it's it's plus or minus one according to whether b uh, belongs to this uh, index two subgroup or not. And so that's that's a linear right. That's a linear map to F two. 
Um, so, so the fact that it's bilinear is uh, um, um, is really is really a consequence of this fact that the, the image of the norm map is index two, and that's um, that's that's really part of this uh, part of local class field theory. I mean, I guess that's going to be true whenever you have an abelian extension. Sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry, so there's something in the chat. Yes, so if, if y is equal to zero, then a is a square, in which case it's it's automatically one, yeah. Um, right, okay, so uh, so at least that's bilinearity. Um, so, right, but so if you wanna prove it without sort of invoking these theorems, then I think it's not so easy, uh, but what you can do is in the case when e is equal to qp, then you can work everything out explicitly, and then it's gonna follow that it is bilinear. So in general, so proving bilinearity directly uh, seems not so easy, but you can you can actually do it just by hand uh, for uh, for e equals qp. Right, so I should also say that if P is odd and you have any finite extension of QP, essentially what works for QP is still gonna work for, for that finite extension. But where you have to sort of work a little bit more is if you have like an extension of Q2. Um, so, okay, sorry, so there were some, yes. Yes, that's a Y, thank you. Okay. Um, so, so you can you can actually work out you can actually just work out explicitly. So, so if, if e is equal to QP, I mean these are finite groups, but they're finite dimensional F two uh, vector spaces, and you can actually just work out the the bilinear the Hilbert symbol by an explicit um, by an explicit computation. Okay, so right, so for example, uh, let's suppose P is greater than two. And let's say I have elements x comma y, which live in QP cross. Um, so then I can write x as some power of p times a p-adic unit. And similarly for y. So here a and b are integers and u and v are p-adic units. So they're in zp cross, they have p-adic valuation equal to zero. Um, right, so, so, so then the statement is that uh, the Hilbert symbol of x comma y, the, the QP Hilbert symbol, uh, is given by minus one to the a times b times epsilon of p times, uh, well, the Legendre symbol of u over p to the bth power times the Legendre symbol of uh, v bar over p to the eighth power. Right, so, so, so here, sorry, I need to explain in this notation. So here, epsilon of p is equal to p minus one over two, um, so that's some integer. And uh, u bar and v bar uh, are living in fp cross and they're the images of u and v. So they're the reductions mod p. And uh, this, this uh, you know, something over p is a Legendre symbol. So in other words, it's the unique non-trivial map from fp cross to uh, plus or minus one. So it detects whether or not your um, the the input is a is a square. Okay. Right. So I think I've defined everything here. So uh, so in particular, right. So this gives a formula for um, for the Hilbert symbol for any two elements of QP um, in terms of well the p-adic valuations. Uh, and then, I mean, you can think of, uh, so, so u and v are the p-adic unit parts of x and y, and then in terms of Legendre symbols. Um, okay, so, so, so this, is, this is something that one can prove pretty directly using Hensel summa. Um, but let me just write, so sub-example. And in fact, the sub-example is, so, so using the facts about the Hilbert symbol that have already been proved, you sort of reduce this general assertion to a couple of special cases. So, so for example, by multiplying x and y by squares, you can assume that a and b are either zero or one. So a sub example is that the Hilbert symbol of u comma v 
the p-adic Hilbert symbol is equal to one. And so here u and v are just p-adic units. Um, so why is that? Because, well, you, you want to show that the quadratic form z squared minus u x squared minus v y squared has a solution. And well, this is a quadratic form over qp, p is greater than two, and it has three p-adic units on the diagonal. So this is going to have a, a solution if and only if it has a solution mod p by Hensel's lemma. And we already know that any quadratic form in three variables over fp has a root. So because this quadratic form has, uh, is isotropic, is isotropic by Hensel's lemma. So I guess we did this example on Friday, but yeah, so since um, it's isotropic mod p. Okay, um, right. So another sub-example, again, you sort of reduce the general case to these two sub-examples using sort of general properties of the Hilbert symbol, in particular that it's invariant under um, like scaling by square. Uh, so um, if you take the p-adic Hilbert symbol of p times the unit time and, and, and a, a p-adic unit, then this is exactly the Legendre symbol of v over p. Um, and so why is that? Well, because if you look at the quadratic form, z squared minus p u x squared minus v y squared, well, in general, if you have a quadratic form over qp where p is greater than two, then you sort of break it up into two pieces where the p-adic valuation is even and the p-adic valuation is odd. And it's isotropic if and only if either of those pieces is isotropic. So this is isotropic if and only if uh, z squared minus v squared, v y squared is isotropic uh, because, because of this, again, this fact about like, classifying isotropic and anisotropic forms over QP. And that's if and only if v sitting inside zp cross is a square. And again, by Hensel's lemma, that's the same as v bar over, over p equals one. OK. So yeah, so these are basically the two examples to keep in mind. And similarly, you can do something where both the p-adic valuations are equal to one. And, um, and then that, that actually implies the general case by, um, just by sort of rescaling. Um, so in fact, so once you've actually computed it, so, so once you've computed it, then it follows that it's a homomorphism. And you can also check directly that, that it's non-degenerate. So by computing directly, it follows that it is a non-singular bilinear map. So we're not proving, you know, this is not an abstract argument. This is supposed to compute it and then you check it. Um, okay, sorry. So actually, I think I should have started with this example. So another example that's worth keeping in mind, the simplest example, uh, is a case where E is the real numbers. Um, so this is the simplest example of the Hilbert symbol. Uh, so in this case, uh, then the Hilbert symbol of A comma B over the real numbers is equal to uh, minus one if uh, A and B are both less than zero, uh, and it's one otherwise. Right, so just looking at um, looking at signs in the in the quadratic form because it's z squared minus ax squared minus by squared. Okay. Um, right, and so finally, I should state the answer for for q two. So for 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 the two addict numbers, it's a little bit more complicated to work out the Hilbert symbol. Uh, uh, sorry, non singular bilinear map. Yes. Right. Sorry. So this is uh, so in particular, non singular. Yes, thank you. Pilot. So in particular, well, you have r cross mod r cross squared times r cross mod r cross squared to you know, plus or minus one. And these are both isomorphic to z mod two. And the map is, well, it's the unique non-zero map. So, OK. Uh, Non-singular, yes? OK, maybe I should say non-degenerate. That's, yeah. Non-degenerate. That's okay. Um, okay. So for p equals two, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, right. So for p equals two, 
Um, one needs to work a little bit more uh, because it's a little bit trickier to determine what the squares are uh, in Q2. Um, so need to use the classification of uh, squares in Q2. And so recall that, for example, I mean, if you have a square in Q2, then its two-attic valuation has to be even. Uh, so, well, we, first of all, then that let's just reduce to the case where it's just in degree zero. And so let's recall that X in Z2 cross is a two-attic unit. Uh, so if and only if X is congruent to one, modulo eight. Um, so that's, that's something you can prove. I think maybe it was on, I don't know if I did it in lecture, but maybe it was in, in one of the, the, the homeworks. And that's something you can prove using the sort of either the refined version of Hensel's lemma, but that's a little bit more refined than the one I explained in the lecture, or by sort of changing coordinates. Um, oh, thank you. Yes, not, not a two-attic unit. It is a two-attic unit, but it is, it's always a two-attic unit, but it's a two-attic square. Thank you. Okay. Right, so, so instead of just working mod p, now you have to work mod p cubed. Um, okay, so again, uh, right. Um, so what was my notation? Sorry, what was my notation again? Yes. Um, right. So, sorry. So suppose you have x equals uh, two to the a times u and y equals two to the b times v. Um, so then the assertion is that the two attic Hilbert symbol x comma y over q two is equal to minus one to the epsilon of u times epsilon of v plus alpha omega of uh, v times beta, oh, sorry, not alpha, sorry, a times omega of v plus b times omega of u, where, so first of all, epsilon of u and epsilon of v is u minus one divided by two, so mod two. Um, and, um, Omega of u is uh, u squared minus one divided by eight, uh, again, mod two, right? So for example, omega of three is going to be, um, 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 is gonna be one, but omega of one is gonna be zero. So yeah, so these are, these are giving you sort of two attic uh, or characters on Z2 cross with values in plus or minus one. And it's, um, it's given by the following formula. Um, so maybe I'll put this on the sort of problem set in, in more detail, but uh, right. So the example is that if you just have two two attic units, so if A and B are equal to zero, uh, right, so, so, so then the two attic Hilbert symbol of U comma B is given by minus one to the U minus one over two times V minus one over two. Um, so, so u minus one over two here is, I guess it's taken mod four. Uh, it's right, it's not an integer, but it is a two attic integer. So you can say whether it's, right, it's, it's divisible by two or not. Oh. Right. Um, right. So use z2 to f2. Um, and right, so if you take the Hilbert symbol of two comma a or two comma u, where u is a two-attic unit, then this is minus one to the u, u squared minus one divided by eight. Okay. So, so these are um, formulas for the, um, the two-attic um, two Hilbert symbol. And again, I guess you can check using this that it's actually a non-degenerate uh, non bilinear, uh, bilinear pairing. Um, so yeah, so these, uh, this might sort of start to remind you of quadratic reciprocity, these, um, these congruences. Um, and in fact, the, the Hilbert, uh, Hilbert symbol turns out to be closely related to quadratic reciprocity. And I think that's going to come up in, um, in one of the, um, one of Dustin's lectures. Um, okay. 
Right. But in any case, one can sort of work everything out pretty explicitly in the case of QP uh, or, or the real numbers. Um, and um, yeah, and so you get these formulas and you can check the bilinearity and so forth. So let me also, um, so I guess in this lecture, I want to, wanted to explain a little bit more about how you can use the Hilbert symbols to, to write down uh, sort of invariance of quadratic forms over, um, over a local field and actually give a give sort of a classification of them. But I also want to continue with something that I explained that I um, sort of explained last time, which is the relation of um, the, uh, the Hilbert symbol to the, um, um, uh, the structure of the vit ring. So the Hilbert symbol so is closely related, or it's sort of encoded to in, in the structure of the vit ring of a local field. So it's closely related to the structure of the vit ring W of E, where E is our local field. Uh, Right, and basically there's the following observation, uh, which is that the form, so, so the Hilbert symbol of A comma B is equal to one. Well, by definition, that's if and only if brackets one minus A minus B is isotropic. And the observation is that this is true if and only if brackets one minus A minus B, AB, which is equal to brackets one minus a tensor, brackets one minus b is hyperbolic. So in other words, zero in the bit ring. And so this is kind of fun to check. And I think I, maybe I put it on yesterday's uh, problem set. So if you have a, a four dimensional quadratic form uh, of, uh, um, of determinant equal to one, so of this form, uh, then it's hy actually hyperbolic if and only if it's isotropic. And that's because if it's isotropic, it always has a hyperbolic piece. And then the complement is going to have, under these assumptions, is also going to have discriminant determinant minus one. And hence, that complement is also going to be forced to be hyperbolic. Um, so actually, this is a special case of a more general statement of involving so-called Pfister forms of quadratic of, uh, of dimension of power of two. But uh, in fact, let's see if you can just check directly. Um, OK. So uh, right. So in particular, uh, this Hilbert symbol is also somehow encoding the multiplication, or it's closely related to the multiplication. Uh, in the uh, in this bit ring, um, and uh, so uh, the fact is that right. So the bit ring of E contains well. So if you sort of unwind this, the right. So the bit ring contains uh, this ideal I, which is the even dimensional forms, fundamental ideal. Um, and right. So a, a consequence of this theory. So I can. I guess this is a consequence that again, if you're working over like some finite extension of Q two. I'm not sure if you can just prove this directly by hand in all cases, uh, but you can sort of, well, by the work that we've done here, it's, you, it sort of gives it to you over QP for, for any P. Um, so in fact, I cubed is equal to zero. Um, and you can, form this, uh, you can form this filtration where you have W of E containing I, containing I squared, uh, and you can form the associated graded and then that contains I cubed, which is equal to zero. Uh, and then you can form the associated graded terms. So GER zero is equal to W of E mod I, which is given by Z mod two, two. GER one is I mod I squared, and that's given by E cross mod E cross squared. This is true actually for any field. This doesn't require it to be local. And GER two is again given by Z mod two. And GER two is given by Z mod two because there's a unique anisotropic form of dimension four. So, and that's, and because again, because I cubed is zero in this case, there's no higher, uh, no higher terms. And uh, right, so you always have a pairing for, from GER1 cross GER1, just a multiplication pairing to GER2, which is Z mod two. And this is a pairing E cross mod E cross squared times E cross mod E cross squared to Z mod two. And that's exactly the Hilbert symbol. So the Hilbert symbol is exactly encoding the multiplication and the associated graded of the bit. And so you might say, okay, well, this lets you prove the bilinearity, but then we have to sort of back up a second because actually seeing that GER2 is Z mod two, you have to do some sort of computation to do that. 
So either I think either you, I think to, to see this, I think you either need some sort of computation or you need to invoke some machinery like a local class rate theory. Okay. So that's a little bit about the Hilbert symbol. Um, I guess what I wanted to say next is right how to use the Hilbert symbol to define the invariance of quadratic forms over local fields. Uh, but in fact, it'll be convenient to say this not just for the Hilbert symbol, but this more general notion of a symbol. Um, so there's the following definition, which is somehow axiomatizing properties of, um, of the Hilbert symbol. And this definition turns out to be, well, well, anyway, let me first give the definition. So let, uh, let F be a field and let A be an abelian group. So a symbol on F with values in A Uh, is a bilinear map, which we'll call phi, which goes from f cross times f cross n to a. Um, and it satisfies this basic identity, which I essentially stated without comment a while back, uh, but turns out to be uh, fundamental, which is that phi of a comma one minus a is equal to zero for a not equal to zero or one. So that's well defined. So a symbol is, is, is just a bilinear map from F cross times F cross into A. So, so right, so to be careful here, bi bilinearity, I'm considering F cross as an abelian group. So when we say bilinear, it's with respect to addition, like the, I mean, it's a multiplication in the field F. So we're considering F cross as an abelian group. Um, and in addition, it satisfies this equation, which I guess is coming from addition in the field somehow. V of A comma one minus A is equal is automatically equal to zero. Uh, and so, right, so this axiomatizes some of the properties of the Hilbert symbol. Right, so bilinear map of Z modules. Yes, thank you. So axiom, oops. Okay, right, so, um, so, you, so, so this is the basic axiom, this, uh, this, this feature here, uh, but in fact, uh, so I wrote down some more properties of the Hilbert symbol that, uh, but in fact, many of those properties are actually consequences of this, this one axiom that phi of a comma one minus a is equal to zero and bilinearity. So for example, um, you also have the property that phi of a comma minus a is equal to zero. Um, and that's because minus a is equal to one minus a divided by one minus a inverse. And so that's gonna give phi of a comma minus a is equal to phi of a comma one minus a divided by one minus a inverse, which is equal to phi of a comma one minus a minus phi of a comma one minus a inverse, which is equal to phi of a comma one minus a plus P of A inverse comma one minus A inverse, and that's equal to zero plus zero plus zero using the, the symbol axiom. Okay, so, so starting the, with the symbol axiom, you also get that uh, you also get some other identities such as phi of A comma minus A plus zero. Again, that was uh, more or less immediate from the definition of the Hilbert symbol, but in fact, it follows from this one property phi of A comma minus A plus zero. Um, So another fact that you get whenever you have a symbol uh, is that it's automatically anti-symmetric. So V of A comma B is equal to minus V of B comma A. So you automatically have anti-symmetry, right? So in, in the case of the Hilbert symbol, we were just taking values in an F2 vector space. So anti-symmetry is the same as symmetry, but in general, if you consider the definition of a symbol, what you'll get is something that it automatically has to be anti-symmetric rather than symmetric. Um, and uh, Right, so how do we see that? Well, we can consider phi of a, b, comma, uh, minus a, b. And so by definition, that's equal to zero. So phi of a, b, uh, comma, minus a, b is equal to zero, as we've just shown. And uh, right, so, 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 so now we can sort of expand this. So we get phi of uh, a, comma, minus a, 
well, that's zero, but uh, phi of a comma b plus phi of b comma minus a uh, plus phi of b comma b. Uh, so we can cross out the first term because we already showed that zero. And uh, we can also rewrite this as phi of, we can also write the second, well, we can write this term right here as phi of b comma a plus phi of b comma minus one, then plus phi of b comma b. And then we get phi of a comma b plus phi of b comma a plus phi of b comma minus b using bilinearity. And this vanishes. And then what we get is that phi of a comma b must be minus phi of b comma a. So anyway, just sort of playing with these identities, you get, you get some additional consequences sort of for free. And in particular, you get this anti-symmetry. Um, okay. So, um, right. For the purposes of quadratic forms, Uh, the main interest is actually in uh, uh, symbols that take values in F2 vector spaces. Uh, but for example, it, it, is, it is sort of uh, interesting and fun to think about symbols that take values in more general groups. Um, so, for example, there's a symbol on QP, um, uh, which with values in, uh, in FP cross called a tame symbol, uh, which actually is a refinement of the Hilbert symbol. Uh, but for, for thinking about quadratic forms, it's actually somehow, um, somehow the, it's, it's just symbols that, that, that take values in, uh, in F2 vector spaces, uh, such as the Hilbert symbol. So yeah, so this definition of a symbol, I, um, I don't know, I think maybe it, maybe it first appears or was first really made systematic in this uh, paper by Milner on algebraic K-theory and quadratic forms. And it, I guess, uh, when you look at it for the first time, I mean, it, it seems kind of, it seems a little ad hoc. Uh, you're just ax imposing this axiom phi of a comma one minus a is equal to zero. Uh, but somehow it turns out to be, uh, somehow it turns out to be sort of really fundamental. Um, and in particular, it, it, it turns out to be, well, for the purposes of this course, one of the, the first ways it turns out to be fundamental is that you can, you know, you can try to classify symbols on, um, on a field. And for example, the classification, so we've seen that the Hilbert symbol gives you uh, a symbol on, on QP, and uh, actually it is like sort of the universal symbol. Uh, it's, it's sort of the only symbol on, on, on QP with values in plus or minus one. Um, and uh, when you try to classify symbols on Q, it, uh, it, it naturally sort of, that's naturally gonna produce quadratic reciprocity. Um, so as, as I think Dustin will explain. Um, but what I wanna explain, I guess, in the rest of today is given a symbol, there's a way of, of naturally extracting sort of numbers from a quadratic form. So given a symbol, there is, a natural way, so given a symbol with values in an F2 vector space, to extract invariants of quadratic forms. Okay, so that's gonna be the following, uh, following construction. So let V from F cross times F cross into some, uh, some abelian group A be a symbol. And suppose also that uh, A, is an, A is actually an F, F2 vector space. Okay, so then there's a way of, of assign, then, then you can use phi to define an invariant of every quadratic form over F. So then, can use the symbol v, phi to define 
an invariant of any quadratic form over f, which I'm going to call epsilon sub phi. And it's going to be an invariant that takes values in this f2 vector space. So if you have a symbol with values in some f2 vector space a, then for every quadratic form, you can, you can write down um, you can write down an invariant of, of, of this F2 vector space A. So here, well, by construction, epsilon sub phi of a quadratic form is, well, if you have a quadratic form brackets A1 through AN, it's going to be defined as the product over all I less than J of uh, phi of A, A, comma, A sub I comma A sub J. Well, sorry, I guess, I guess I'm writing A as an abelian group, so I should really say it's a sum, because we're sort of adding them. Yeah, right, so in practice, phi is going to be plus or minus one, so can think about the product, but anyway, let me write it this way. Okay, so, so this is, this is, so for every, um, every quadratic form of the, that looks like brackets A1 through AN, we're going to write down this element in, in A, and that's going to be the invariant of the quadratic form. Okay, so, so this is what we want to be our definition, but we need to show that it's well-defined. So what we need to do, we need to show that this is actually invariant of the choice of the diagonalization. So, so this is how we want to define the invariant. Uh, sorry, so there's a question. What does it say at the end of the line, um, epsilon sub phi in A? Sorry, that's... Uh, I'm confused. Oh, right above. Um, any quadratic form over f. Yes. Sorry for my handwriting. <laughs> okay. So what we need to show is that this is independent of the diagonalization. And so it actually is an invariant of a quadratic form. Um, and right, so so in fact, this is this is uh, um, right. So we we saw sometime last week that if you want to go from one diagonalization to another diagonalization, there's basically sort of a, a set of moves you're allowed to do for a given diagonalization, and uh, you can always get from one diagonalization to another diagonalization, another diagonal sequence using this sort of sequence of moves, and each of these moves is only going to change two terms. Okay. So recall from last week that there's this finite set of moves. Well, there's this, these three different types of moves that one is allowed to do on a diagonalization that you can get from one isomorph. I mean, that you're, if you're within the same isomorphism class, you can get from one to another. Um, and so all we really need to do is, is we need to show that epsilon phi is invariant under these, these moves. Right, so, so brackets A comma B is isomorphic to, um, well, sorry. So for example, brackets A comma B is isomorphic to brackets B comma A. Brackets A comma B is isomorphic to brackets A comma B times some element squared. And brackets A comma B is isomorphic to brackets A plus B, AB over A plus B. So, okay, so these were the three moves as I explained it last time. Um, but in fact, maybe instead of just writing them out explicitly, the main thing is that they only depend on two terms at a time. So they, they somehow, they only depend on isomorphisms of two-dimensional quadratic forms. So I guess if you think about this, it's, it's going to imply, uh, yeah, so a, B, a plus B is not zero for the last one. Yeah, thanks. Um, so if you want to show that this construction of epsilon phi is actually well-defined, what you really need is, is just a, a fact about two-dimensional quadratic forms. So if A comma B is isomorphic to C comma D, so via, for example, the above moves, then the symbol phi of A comma B is iso or it's not isomorphic, it's equal. It's just equal to phi of C comma D, right? So, so, so what you need to do is you need to essentially show something for two-dimensional quadratic forms. 
Um, so th this is the basic thing one has to check. And um, right, so, so in fact, what's, what's sort of nice is that the, the definition of a symbol is sort of precisely, it, it just sort of works perfectly for, for something like this to be true. Um, so in fact, right, so if A comma B is isomorphic to C comma D, then we can write C as uh, AX squared plus BY squared for some X and Y uh, in, our, um, in our field. And in fact, sort of by rescaling, well, so it's, it's sort of clear that if you, right, so if, if, if you rescale by a square, then that's not gonna change the value of the symbol because the symbol is taking values in an F2 vector spaces. So for, so for definiteness, and in fact, without loss of generality, uh, we can just say that C is equal to A plus B. So in fact, we can sort of work in, in the case of the last example. So, so C is equal to A, A plus B. Right, and so, so then, right, so what do we have? We have A divided by C plus B divided by C is equal to one. So if we're in this kind of type of situation, so for example, X is equal to one, Y is equal to one. Sorry, so I, didn't, I, I think I didn't say that well. Um, you, you wanna see that it's invariant under the following three moves. And well, it's, we're assuming, we, we've seen that phi is anti-symmetric or, and which means symmetric since we're working with F2 vector spaces. So it's, it's invariant under the first move. And it's also invariant under the second move because it's bilinear and it is unchanged and we're taking values in F2 vector space. So we really just need to see the last one. So we can let C equals A plus B. We have A divided by C plus B divided by C equals one, which gives by the symbol property phi of A over C times B of A over C, uh, comma B of A over C is equal to one. And now we can sort of expand out all the terms. So that's phi of A comma B times phi of A comma C times phi of, again, we'll use symmetry phi of B comma C times B of C comma C is equal to one. And that's gonna give phi of, um, sorry, I think I've been going back between additive and multiplicative notation, but hopefully it's not too confusing. So phi of A comma B times phi of um, ABC comma C is equal to one and ABC equals D up to squares. So, so this is also equal to phi of, so this implies that phi of A comma B is equal to phi of C comma D. Sorry, so I said this a little bit quickly, but essentially the point is that this, this last move that you're allowed to do when you, when you change, uh, you know, you go between two, uh, two dimensional quadratic forms is exactly sort of governed by this, this relation phi of A comma one minus A is equal to zero. Um, and, and it lets you show that you have a well-defined invariant for two dimensional quadratic forms. And then essentially that gives you it in general because any isomorphism between diagonal forms is, is gonna sort of be obtained by composing these isomorphisms of two dimensional forms. Okay, so, um, so that's the proof. So for example, if E is a local field, So then what we can do is we can define for each quadratic form an invariant in plus or minus one by the above construction applied to the Hilbert symbol. So let's call this epsilon of B. If V is a quadratic, each quadratic form, each quadratic space V, we get a sine plus or minus one by taking the, yeah, thanks. Right. Um, yeah, so epsilon is not to be confused with E and my handwriting is such that you can't believe. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay. Right. Uh, so so we, we got a sign by, by taking essentially the products of the Hilbert symbols along the diagonals. And that gives a, a sign plus or minus one. 
Um, so this is called uh, the Hassan invariant. And it comes from, it comes from, from the Hilbert symbol. Um, and just sort of a warning is that it's not quite additive. So it's not true that if you take epsilon of V direct sum V prime, it's equal to epsilon of V times epsilon of V prime. But then there's also a cross term, which is the Hilbert symbol of the, 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 the determinant of V and the determinant of V prime. Um, so, so you have this construction called the Hassan variant and it, I guess just the only thing sort of warning is that uh, it's not quite, uh, it's, it's not a, hum, it's not a, it's not a map on Grotendieck-Vet rings. It, it, it satisfies this, this extra, I mean, this is the sort of addition rule. Um, okay, and so then there's the following theorem, which is that uh, it, this is a complete, well, this together with the discriminant and the dimension. Um, yeah, sorry, yes. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think I was, yeah. Okay, so in fact, right. So maybe if we go back up, I should, maybe since we're using everything, so I didn't do this right. So let's, let's just write it multiplicatively. Let's write, because A is gonna be plus or minus one. Um, let's write everything multiplicatively. And, um, yeah, so thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry about that. Okay, so, so here's the sort of main theorem. So if E is any local field of characteristic not two, then quadratic forms over E are isomorphic. Uh, so if and only if, well, first of all, they have the same dimension. Okay, so that's pretty necessary. Um, and then they have the same determinant. So the determinant of the quadratic form lives in E cross modulo E cross squared. And if E is QP, so imagine E is QP, then that's, that's, a, that's an F2 vector space of dimension two if P is odd or three is P, P is equal to two. And then same uh, Hassan variant. Okay, so this is the main theorem, um, main sort of classification theorem. Um, this is also very closely related to the statement about vit rings that I that I also mentioned earlier. So the vit ring of E is basically seeing, I mean, it's seeing up to associated gradients. It's basically seeing this E cross mod E cross squared and, uh, and the uh, Hilbert symbol pairing into plus or minus one. Um, when you define it this way, it's actually a slightly different statement. It's sort of off by like some sort of exponential, um, but so, okay, so this is also true. Um, okay, so I guess I should just say, say something about the proof. Um, so the proof of this, most of the ingredients, so again, so we're not gonna be, right, so we, we don't have the ingredients to prove this as I've stated, but we basically have the ingredients when E is equal to QP. So when E is equal to QP, we basically have the ingredients um, and it essentially is going to follow from, well, Essentially, the main point is that quadratic forms of dimension five are isotopic. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm about out of time, so I should just sort of say, say why this is true. So the main point of, of why this is true is really that quadratic forms are, um, main point is that quadratic forms of dimension five are isotropic and quadratic forms well, there's a unique anisotropic quadratic form of dimension four. So basically, if, if you have quadratic forms, let's say, um, or quadratic spaces V and V prime have, um, sorry, so let's say, so V comma Q, and V prime comma Q prime have the same invariance, then what you want is that uh, they're isomorphic. And that's the same as saying that V direct sum V prime with the quadratic form Q, Q direct sum minus Q prime 
is hyperbolic. It's the same by VIT cancellation for, um, for, for this to be hyperbolic. And now what we want to show is that, right, so you, you want some criterion for a quadratic form to be hyperbolic. And what's going to happen is that if, if you have two quadratic spaces with the same invariance, this is going to have the same invariance as a hyperbolic form, a hyperbolic form of the appropriate dimension, because we know how the determinant and the house invariant behave in direct sums. So you reduce to showing that if you have a quadratic form with the same invariance as a hyperbolic form, it's hyperbolic. And you prove this by, now you prove this by induction on the dimension, because once you're a dimension at least five, you can anyway split off, well, here it's dimension six, because it's even, you can split off, you can split off a quadratic, you can split off a hyperbolic form because, uh, because quadratic forms of dimension at least five are hyperbolic. Um, so you can keep doing this, and essentially you then just have to prove this in dimension four. And in dimension four, if you have a quadratic form of discriminant one, uh, or of determinant one, um, then it's either isotropic, uh, then it's either anisotropic, in which case it, you can detect that from the Haas invariance sort of by construction, or it's completely hyperbolic. Um, so maybe I'll put some of these details, try to put some of these details on the, on, on, on the homework set. But um, this is essentially sort of a restatement of the classification in you know, the main sort of results about quadratic forms um, over, over these local fields. And it's, it's, really, it's really sort of a restatement uh, just in terms of a slightly, you know, slightly uh, different way of normalizing the variance. Okay, so I guess I will end here. So um, yeah, before I end, I just wanna also thank um, yeah, PCMI and the organizers for the invitation uh, to, um, yeah, to, to this uh, summer school. Um, and I also wanna thank the, um, I wanna thank the TAs. Uh, so Neven, uh, Morgan and Freddie for all of their work. Um, I, so Dustin will take over for the lecture starting tomorrow. I will still be around. And so feel free to email me uh, or free, feel free to ask me or email me or ask me questions in so Coco or Discord and so forth. And um, yeah, so thanks, thanks a lot for your uh, time and attention. So. Could I also I suggest that we all unmute and give Akil <laughs> <laughs> applause for a wonderful series of lectures. <laughs>